Welcome again, everybody, to these um, monthly talks that are to foster the global happiness and well-being movement. We have John DeGraff, who is co-founder with the Happiness Initiative with myself, Laura Musikansky, is author of What's the Economy for Anyway, a really important book on a new economic paradigm, and recently came back from Bhutan, where he helped advise the government on gross national happiness. So we'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead, John. Okay. It's great to be with all of you, and thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk for a while just about the, uh, my experiences in Bhutan, what Bhutan is doing, and uh, a little bit about uh, what, what happened there and what we learned from it, and then uh, want to involve you in this conversation. So to start, uh, Bhutan, uh, if you have the slides in front of you, Bhutan is a, a very small country, I'm sure Many of you are very aware of Bhutan and where it is. Uh, there's uh, right between China and India, only three quarters of a million people. It is the only country in the world without a stoplight. Uh, they once had three of them and uh, they, they had protests and so they pulled them out. And so they're now just uh, a couple of places where policemen kind of wave you around a, a circle, but they, it's really that small a place. Bhutan uh, keeps currently about 70% of its area in forest. By law, it needs to keep 60% of the land in forest and intends to do that. And those forests are uh, uh, sequester quite a bit of carbon. Bhutan doesn't produce much carbon anyway, but the forests sequester enough so that Bhutan is actually, uh, I think, the only carbon negative country in the world that's actually sequestering more carbon than it's producing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Bhutan isn't being affected by uh, carbon and carbon in the atmosphere. It is actually suffering quite seriously from global warming because its Himalayan glaciers are melting. And as they do so, they are breaking the da uh, dams and the lakes uh, over are flooding over at the base of the glaciers and causing flooding in various parts of Bhutan. And so it's a, something that the country is very, very concerned about. We'll go on to... There you go. Ah. So Bhutan is a beautiful country, uh, very verdant and green in much of the season, but, but uh, the whole northern part of the country is an extremely high area of the Himalayas. The passes to China are 18,000 feet high, for example. Uh, the highest peaks uh, of the Bhutan Himalayas are close to 25,000 feet in elevation, over 7,000 meters. Uh, this country has has often been considered the model for the famous Shangri-La, the book Lost Horizon that came out in the 1930s of a, this magical kingdom in uh, in the Himalayas. So it's it's a beautiful place. This is uh, was was just fun to be there. I was there in the dead of winter, so it didn't quite look like this, but um, I'm hoping to go again. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Uh, and Bhutan, as people, uh, the, the population is about two-thirds uh, Bhutanese and Buddhist. About one-third of the population is Hindu in the south. Uh, they are primarily uh, Nepali in uh, ethnic origin. Um, of course, as you can see, uh, the, the, the people have a, a kind of a, a, a common national dress. It's called the Go for men and the Kiri for women. Uh, the, the national sport of the country is archery, and you see this, and the, the targets are actually 140 meters. That's almost a, that's a football field and a half away. So just imagine shooting an arrow into a bullseye, uh, a football field and a half uh, away. Uh, uh, Bhutan is, is kind of famous in a way for its architecture. It has a particularly unique style. Some people think of it as a cross between uh, Swiss chalets and Japanese pagodas, but nonetheless, it's, it's quite interesting. It has inspired some uh, uh, things that are, in my view, quite, quite humorous, and I want to mention one of this for you those for you. There's a university in the United States which calls itself Bhutan on the Border, and you can look that up. It happens to be the University of Texas at El Paso, 
And all of the architecture of all the buildings on that campus are designed in Bhutanese style and have been since 1917 when the college was first established. It turned out that a woman who gave a big donation to start the, the university uh, had seen an article in a 1914 National Geographic called Castles in the Sky uh, about Bhutanese architecture. And she was so taken by it was in black and white. She thought that the uh, the hills in the background looked a lot like the hills around El Paso. They they definitely don't. They're a lot more green and white, but in black and white, you can't really tell that. And so in giving the money to the university, she said that in perpetuity, all the architecture had to be in this Bhutanese style. And even the ATM machines at the University of Texas, El Paso, are they look like little Buddhist shrines. So it, it's kind of a one of the ways that Bhutan's architecture has influenced the world. You see on the uh, left-hand side, in the uh, upper corner, the tiger's nest. This is a, a, a monastery on the side of a very, very steep uh, cliff that people go to. It's one of the fabled places uh, in Bhutan. Go ahead. Okay, I love it. So it was uh, in Bhutan in 1972 that a young king, uh, 16 or 17 years old, uh, Jigmi Singhi Wangchuk, was crowned upon the death of his father. He was the fourth king in the dynasty, the current dynasty in Bhutan. And the story goes that when he took the throne, he was asked on his coronation by an Australian reporter, so King, what are you going to do to increase your country's gross national product? And uh, the story goes that King Wong Chuck thought about this and he said, well, with all due respect, sir, I believe that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And had this happened in the United States, people probably would have smiled and gone on to the business of making money. Uh, or uh, they might have even sent for the men in the white coats. But in Bhutan, people take the king very seriously. And so for the next 40 years, Bhutan started looking at how do you actually measure this thing called gross national happiness and how do you uh, improve it for people? And uh, as part of this, Bhutan came up with the idea that there are nine key domains or conditions for gross national happiness. The first of these is the one we think of when we measure GDP. Uh, this is material well-being, basically standard of living is another way to put it, uh, financial security. Uh, money matters, and the Bhutanese recognize that money matters, but it's not the only thing. So there are the, these other domains of well-being as well physical health, psychological well-being, which you might think of as mental health, uh, environment, and that includes access to nature, to green space, to uh, things of that sort. Community vitality, which actually includes social connection to friends and family, but also participation in community, volunteering and so forth, and a sense of trust in, in uh, one's neighbors and in the community. Cultural vitality, which includes access to arts and culture, but also includes uh, a diversity in the culture and the maintenance of old cultural traditions and things so that they are not stamped out by uh, a Western monoculture of, of consumerism and so forth. Uh, government is an important domain, that government be transparent, that it be democratic, that it be participatory so people can be involved. But when the King of Bhutan discovered how important democratic government is for happiness based on happiness science, he decided to abdicate and turn the government over to a democratic republic and a parliamentary system, which is what it is today. A time balance is one that means a lot, particular to me. This is really work-life balance. You might think of, think of it as uh, really uh, uh, relief from from the stress of working and and having leisure time and all of those uh, a lot of a lot of surveys of well-being don't really look at this at all they don't take this factor into account but bhutan does they consider it very important and one thing i learned in being in bhutan is that um the, the bhutanese take this seriously enough that they have 30 days vacation as poor a country as they are, 12 additional national holidays for a total of about 42, and then there are feast days in various villages and so forth. And in the winter, 
uh, Bhutan shortens its workday so that the workday starts at nine in the morning and ends at four in the afternoon. And it does that so no one has to go to or return from work in the dark. Seems a pretty civilized idea to me. Uh, education, and this is really about access to lifelong learning. We have to think of education in that sense, not just for the formal side. Although in its concern for this, Bhutan has enormously increased its literacy rate from one of the lowest in the world to uh, now uh, quite, quite good. And then finally, uh, community vitality. Oh, I mentioned that, community vitality. So these are the, the domains of well-being that Bhutan takes seriously as it measures GNH and it does this with surveys, it does this with objective data and so forth. Uh, so again, I mentioned that when the king found out about governance, he abdicated, he turned, uh, this is uh, the, the man on the right is Jigme Wangchuk who coined the phrase gross national happiness. Um, his son is on the left, the, the new king, the king abdicated. He also tur turned the throne over to his uh, son, uh, and, who is now, uh, now the king. He's uh, 30, 33 years old at this time. So the process that by which Bhutan uses gross national happiness to uh, drive its policies and ideas starts with a, a survey. Uh, about 7,000 people are surveyed. Uh, and it's a long survey. It takes about four hours to do. There are literally hundreds of questions uh, around each of these domains. And then uh, that's taken out to communities all over Bhutan. You can see, see it being done here. And, and then the survey itself is analyzed. What does it show for all of these communities? How do people respond? How well are they doing in each of these areas? Uh, Bhutan uses a set of policy tools that look to, in, in order to make its major legislative decisions. So if it has a big decision to make, it says, how will this affect health? How will this affect education? How will this affect each of the domains? And it scores that and it has a commission, the GNH commission, which consists of 24 people. They are experts in different areas of life. They come together and they give their best judgment about each one of these major legislative things in terms of whether it will improve the welfare of people, keep it the same or make it worse. And then from that, the commission makes a report and says, yes, parliament should pass this. No, it shouldn't. In one case, for example, uh, the decision to join the World Trade Organization, it just didn't pass muster. And so uh, Bhutan decided not to do it. It didn't score high enough with the policy tool. Same thing with a major hydroelectric plant that Bhutan was recently planning, would have brought a lot of money into the country for sale of hydropower to India, but Bhutan felt it would have had uh, very bad environmental effects, effect, bad effects on, on cultural preservation, on uh, equity and other things. So they chose not to do it. Uh, very interesting to make policy this way. And I think a lot of people here are interested in how this policy tool might be applied to our own circumstances. Now, Bhutan has taken its message of GNH to the world as a whole. And so in July of 2011, it got the United Nations to declare that the pursuit of happiness ought to be the goal of all member nations and that they ought to find ways to measure their success in achieving the pursuit of happiness. And we have to remember that that comes right out of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, like liberty and the pursuit of happiness coming from Thomas Jefferson. So Bhutan is really taking that originally quintessential American message now to the whole world. Uh, Bhutan held at the U.N. a major meeting on April 2nd of last year, which Laura and I and a number of our colleagues were able to attend, brought 800 people together from around the world to begin to promote this concept. And uh, as part of that, created four key working groups. Uh, one is a GNH or well-being and happiness group, uh, an environment or sustainability group, a fair distribution or equity group, and then finally a communications group in order to uh, get the message out to the world. And I had the opportunity as part of the well-being and happiness group um, to visit Bhutan in late January and early February of this 
gear for what was called a, a international uh, expert working group uh, meeting with the governor government of Bhutan, and uh, they brought about 45 people from around the world to engage in this conversation. We were part of these four working groups. Here is our overall group in Bhutan, and uh, you can see me down there on the, the, the right. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, you, you can see the diversity of people represented a great number of countries, including members of the European Parliament, uh, uh, labor minister from Brazil, head of the uh, economic director of the OECD, the head of the European Environment Agency, quite a collection of people. I was very much a small fish in, in, in a pond of big fish uh, in this particular case, but it was an honor to be there and, and to share in this conversation. Uh, in the back, you will see a couple standing together. Um, a very uh, beautiful young woman and a young man with his the characteristic um, Bhutanese outfit, the gold, those, that is the king and queen. Uh, and uh, next to the king is Prime Minister Jimmy Timley, uh, who has been a major leader in all of this in taking Bhutan's message to the rest of the world. And this is our own smaller working group. This was the, the uh, GNH or Wellbeing and Happiness working group that I was part of. And it was led by the gentleman on the, the right, the, the Bhutanese gentleman kind of in the front on the right. His name is Karma Ura, and he is director of the Center for Bhutan Studies and probably the leading intellectual scholar in developing the ideas of GNH, the domains, and, and so forth, and taking them around the world. Just an absolutely fascinating fellow. The older gentleman on the, uh, on the left side uh, with the cap on is um, Paul Singer, and he is a minister of labor in, in Brazil. He's the founder of the political party, uh, the Workers' Party, which actually runs Brazil today. So again, uh, absolutely fascinating individual among, among many in this group. Uh, here's just myself uh, on, the, on the right here with a group with the Prime Minister Tinley. The other folks uh, are uh, a, a professor from China, whose name is Jing, um, uh, Yevgeny, who is from Russia, from Moscow, and Alejandro Adler, who is at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He's a PhD student originally from Mexico. And that's Prime Minister Tinley. And uh, Prime Minister Tinley, in, interestingly enough, uh, went to college in the United States. He went to Penn State. He's currently up for re-election. The election is going on right as we speak. In fact, uh, I think the, the final day of the election is um, on the 31st of May. And uh, then we'll decide that it's likely that Prime Minister Tinley will be re-elected, but it is not certain. Uh, interestingly enough, and again, one of those funny details is that his uh, opponent um, went to Pitt, which was which is Penn State's major uh, competitor in football, basketball, and all of those sort of things. So we have a the battle here in the elections of Bhutan between Pitt and Penn State. Um, we had the chance, the opportunity, while I was there, to meet the king and queen of. Bhutan, and this was a wonderful opportunity, absolutely delightful people. Uh, King Wangchuk studied in the United States. He went to Phillips Andover in Massachusetts for high school. He went to Wheaton College uh, for undergraduate school, also in Massachusetts. And then he went on to Oxford to study international relations. He is a very popular guy, not only in Bhutan, but all over Asia where he's called Prince Charming. And uh, he's able to fill stadiums in places like Thailand and Japan when he speaks. He is also, I found out while I was there, a great devotee of the game of basketball, as is the queen. She was, in fact, the captain of her college basketball team. And the king loves to play basketball, and I talked with him about this while I was there. My hope is that when he comes to the United States in June of 2014 to, to promote Bhutan's work in the United Nations, that we will see a basketball game, uh, including the King of Bhutan and President Obama, who we all know is a great basketball fan and player as well. 
and the king of Bhutan is well aware of that and is very anxious for the possibility of playing basketball with President Obama. I think that can be a wonderful event to, to try to get the media interested in the concept of GNH. Uh, so next steps, carrying this uh, work and message to the United Nations, our committees uh, are working in drafting major documents along those lines. They will be presented to the UN this coming fall, and then the final presentation will be made in June of 2014. The Prime Minister and the King visit the UN. The hope is to have uh, this work uh, around equitable and sustainable well-being and happiness be the UN's next stage of work uh, following its current work, which is called the Millennium Development Goals, and they, they end in 2015. So next year, there will be the presentation. Uh, my hope is that we will also have in the U.S. a Health and Happiness Summit at that time. Uh, we've been talking with people from the U.S. Public Health Service about that who are interested in that idea. Uh, and, and so uh, there, there are a number of things that may happen. We may also have a, a, another happiness conference on the West Coast. We hope there'll be the basketball game and we'll be involved in a number of these things. And I'm hoping that uh, we'll be putting together a film on the subject as well. So, uh, so this is what I, I think is kind of a new perspective, a new narrative for the future that car uh, carries the pursuit of happiness concept forward. Uh, uh, this was a concept that began in the United States, the world's first uh, continuous democracy, uh, now its richest and most powerful nation. It was uh, part of a docu document, the Declaration of Independence, which was essentially the protest against the king, King George III of England. The same concept is now being carried to the world by its newest democracy, a very small and in fact poor country. And this uh, uh, movement is being led by not only the prime minister, but also by a king himself. And interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, King Wangchuk is exactly the same age today as Thomas Jefferson was when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. I think the story is, as I mentioned here, almost biblical. It's a story of, of the, a poor and small country really helping the, the rich and powerful and big countries to understand how to live more richly, how to focus on different things, happiness, compassion, care, all of those things. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a marvelous story, and we need to tell it as a story to the world like that. Now, while I was in, in Bhutan, uh, we didn't all agree on everything, and then that's not surprising when people came from so many countries and 45 people and all of them very high-powered academics and so forth. So there were some differences over words like, you know, do you say happiness or well-being? How much of this is personal? How much of this is about policy? And so forth. Uh, and these... Uh, how much should we get into the environment? How much should we get into equity? These were the kind of questions and conversations that we had. And I think for me, a lot of this was really put together in a great way by Enrico Giovannini, who was then the chief statistician for the uh, government of Italy, and just last week was named Italy's new Minister of Labor and Social Issues. So this is a very high-powered guy and a wonderful guy. And what Enrico did was he said, we need to understand that we're all in this together, that all of these things matter. It's not either or. It's not personal versus or political. It's not happiness or well-being. And here's how to think of that. And he laid out uh, a way to do that. And he said, think of well-being as the objective data, the objective factors uh, of these conditions of life using uh, Bhutan's domains using, or using something like the Genuine Progress Indicator. So this would include, you know, uh, data like life expectancy and things like that. But happiness is subjective, and it is well-being, which is necessary but not sufficient for happiness, plus what we think of and have to think of as happiness skills. Let's just go ahead. And those happiness skills are what we've learned from happiness science and from the world's religious traditions and so forth about what matters on a personal basis, what kind of behaviors, what kind of attitudes 
can make you happier despite uh, your your conditions of life. Uh, if the conditions of life are good, it can make you happier yet. If they're not so good, it can still help out in an important way. And so these are some of those, compassion coming certainly out of, out of Buddhism and, and much of Bhutan's work has come from its Buddhist traditions. Altruism, um, you know, thinking of, of, of others first, generosity, uh, giving, um, mindfulness, and, and uh, again, meditation and these, these kind of things also coming out of the Buddhist tradition, but they're, they're true uh, for all of us. And we know that, that being mindful matters and, and we even have ways to measure that. Tolerance, so that uh, an acceptance for others and, uh, and in fact, really more than tolerance, appreciation of diversity and of other people and of their cultures and, and concerns. Sociability, being able to connect to others because we know that social connection is hugely important. And so it's actually important to know how to be a good friend, how to be uh, someone who connects well with others. And finally, gratitude and, and really appreciating what we we have each day and asking questions, what am I grateful for now? And I very much appreciate that Laura does this every day and she comes up with a, a statement about this uh, each day on her site. So these are happiness skills and combined with good conditions of life, they lead to, uh, to, to happiness itself. And so here's well-being, uh, data like life expectancy, like leisure time, like uh, uh, median income, these kinds of things. And then happiness is really our self-assessment, our subjective assessment. How healthy do we feel? How much time stress, how much of a sense of leisure, how much of a sense of financial security do we, do we have? And these are the kind of things that I think the Happiness Initiative measures so uh, effectively. So when you combine the two, the objective data and the subjective data, you, I, I think that's uh, Joe Benini was right, that this is a very good way to understand this and to say, no, happiness and and well-being may be slightly different in their meaning, but both words matter and both words are important. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, this is really what I had to say, uh, and I want to open this to your questions and, and comments and so forth. So great. This is a point where you can go ahead and ask a question, and you can do this um, on your control board. You can either ask a question, um, type it in, and I'll read it out so that the people who are listening later on these recorded um these recorded recordings will hear it, or you can raise your hand if you have speaker and headphones. And I encourage you to do that, and then I'll um, I'll unmute you so you can ask your question in person. So go ahead and people have any questions? Just waiting. Um, so uh, while we're waiting, so John, why don't you talk a little bit? I'm going to go back to the slide. Why don't you talk a little bit? about um, how the how Bhutan measures happiness. So what is the, what is the measure that they're working with? What does that look like? Um, and how does that different differ from other measures that are being used here with the happiness initiative and that are being used in the UK, um, in Brazil and other places where happiness is being measured? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, Bhutan's measurement of GNH, its index, is a very complex tool. If you read the book, you see, see how much real science and math goes into this. I mean, some of it's kind of mind-boggling, the calculus and, and so forth. But what Bhutan does is it has an enormous survey, very lengthy sur survey, and it, it actually judges uh, certain points as providing sufficiency in a in any particular condition of life. So uh, if you get so many points in, in your, your answers to this to a question around health, that may mean that you have sufficiency in, in the category of health. And you have to have sufficiency in a certain number of categories at a certain level in order to be declared happy. And Bhutan has you even different classes of happiness and unhappiness. So it's very complex, too too complex to explain here, but you can go to the uh, Gross National Happiness website and you, you can actually see some of the detail around this. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great model. Um, 
it, it does combine both objective information and subjective. It's probably well beyond what other countries are going to do in the in the near future and maybe quite hard to do that in huge places to get that kind of data. But there are some other really good models for measuring happiness and Bhutan is very supportive of these as well. So the UK has uh, issued a, a report of well-being for the nation. It uses surveys and issues reports along with uh, the GDP data. These are very valuable about and it uses quite similar concepts of health and, and psychological well-being and, and so forth uh, to measure that. The uh, country of Canada has what what is called the Canadian Index of Well-Being. And this is a very much like uh, Bhutan's GNH. It includes all of the domains uh, that are on the screen with the exception of psychological well-being, which is basically considered kind of happiness overall. Though, so there are eight dimensions. There are uh, nine uh, uh, sub-dimensions for each of those in the Canadian well-being, and so it, it uses objective data, again, to measure how well people are doing. It does not have a subjective survey as part of that. Um, Australia is starting to do this with national measurement. Japan is starting to do this with the national measurement. And the Happiness Initiative uh, here in the United States is doing this, and of course you can take the Happiness Survey uh, and you will get a score that compares your well-being with that of other people in the United States. Around each of these domains, and one additional domain, which is work, uh, workplace satisfaction, uh, you know, how, how much do you like your job, how much control do you have in your job, and so forth. Bhutan doesn't measure this, uh, partly because so many of Bhutan's uh, uh, folks are independent farmers and so forth, and have a lot of people working in factories and and big offices and such. But in the, in the United States, we know that workplace satisfaction is hugely important for people's happiness. Gallup has pointed that out. And so we have included that in the happiness survey. Great, thank you, John. Does, does anybody else have any questions? I'd love to get some questions from other people. So um, while we're waiting, okay, great, awesome. So Natasha, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Hi yes. yes. Uh, question, question about, about the, the impact, impact that, that um, you were you're saying, saying this is going to make, make uh, for, for other, other surrounding bigger, bigger nations. nations. Um, um, can you maybe talk, talk a little, little bit more about, about that? that? Or is, is it too much in the future, future to tell um, what kind of impact this could, could really make for surrounding countries? countries? Well, I think what's uncertain is to the degree to which these other countries are going to pick up on this. You know, if they yeah. take this seriously, I think uh, the impact will be enormous because we'll suddenly be be thinking about uh, measuring something other than the churn of money in the in the country, the 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 GDP per se. And to some degree, you get what you measure. So if we're starting to look at these other things, if we have the population understanding that well-being includes a lot more than money, uh, I think that, that that's going to affect many things. Now, if you take this seriously and, and the science seriously, you'll also understand that that means making a renewed commitment to greater equality because inequality is pretty toxic overall for well-being. There are a number of studies that show that. It certainly means... Uh, taking sustainability seriously, everything from global warming to, uh, to you know, water, water pollution to, to peak oil and all of those, those kind of things. Uh, if we get it in our heads that well-being and happiness are what matters, and if we understand that you need all these things to be happy, not just money, it will really, I think, change things in a major way. Time balance for me is a big one. I'm very concerned about this. I think uh, if we understand the importance and value of time balance, we will look to do things like reducing unemployment by sharing and spreading work around, not just by growing the economy to produce more 40, 50, 60 hour a week jobs. So one of the things this can do is when you get a policy a goal, then you, you don't look at it just for what what this policy about health will do for health. You also say, what is how is it going to affect these other things? It's a very holistic thing. If the world can begin to think like that, 
I, I just imagine that, that the implications are enormous, but the, it's up to us to try to get the world to think like that. Thank you. Anything else, Natasha? Uh, so in terms of transferability then of these demonstrations, um, is, why is Bhutan a great place to kind of uh, see where these measurements can make an impact in daily life and in that community? I think because they've done it, because they they are really taking this seriously. I mean, you just have no idea until you're there how seriously that government does take this. And uh, uh, I think the fact that they are taking it so seriously and that they are actually making policy based on the impact on well-being and happiness is, is huge. We have to look at what the outcomes will be. Uh, a lot of people go around saying things like, oh, Bhutan, the world's happiest country or the happiest kingdom. Bhutan doesn't say that. In fact, the, the, the Bhutanese are very, they're not happy that people go around talking about Bhutan being the world's happiest country because they understand that they are not the world's happiest country. They'd like to be that. And that's the goal is, is to be a, as happy a country uh, as they can be. But they understand that they've got a lot of work to do, that they have problems. Uh, they have issues like every other, other country. Sometimes they're different issues. For example, Bhutan has banned smoking. People don't really smoke in Bhutan. They did this for health reasons and for happiness reasons. Now, that's a very positive thing, but the Bhutanese will be the first to admit that they have issues with things like alcoholism. So they, they have social problems uh, as well, and they are trying to change those things. They've made enormous progress in terms of reduce, uh, increasing life expectancy, reducing illiteracy, and so forth, but um, they've got a ways to go. And I think we'll really be able to see how some of this is working when uh, some of the larger and wealthier countries start doing a little bit of it. Great. Natasha, is that good enough answer for you? That's, That's great. great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. And if anybody else has any questions, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go forward with the question until we get... Oh, Anna, you have a question. Awesome. So I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, Anna. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, um, my question, question is, is what, what, what is the, the real source of resistance to this concept, concept that you met when you talked talk with uh, people on the side of the town? Um, GDP, GDP is just equally, if not more complex and very misleading as a measure of success. Um, and we know that after a certain level is reached, there is no correlation between well-being and happiness and GDP. In other words, if it goes up, it doesn't mean that everyone's happier anyway. So what, what, are, what are the main arguments against an approach like this that you've discovered when you're out promoting it? I think it depends on who you talk to. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. that that people are, uh, across the political spectrum are beginning to realize the, the limitations of GDP. I, I think that's much broader than the acceptance of GNH or happiness uh, as the goal. Uh, but some of that's happening. I mean, the, the Cameron government in the, United, in the UK is a conservative uh, government. Uh, it, its policies, in, some might say, are not necessarily promoting GNH, but the Cameron government is taking the measuring of this uh, quite seriously, uh, the Sarkozy government, again, a conservative government in in France, uh, has become very interested in this because they do understand that GDP has serious limitations. I think the objections to this are varied. A lot of them, uh, when I talk to policymakers, and I think when Laura talks to policymakers, some of them say they don't like the term happiness. They think happiness can mean you know, anything, and so it's not valuable, and they prefer the term well-being. Uh, the problem is the general public, we find, tends to prefer the term happiness and think that the term well-being is kind of a wonkish, you know, academic sort of thing. So, But but that's where I think the Giovannini uh, uh, model is very helpful, because he says that they are two somewhat different things, and they're both important. And uh, and I think I'm beginning now to talk to policymakers along those lines, that uh, that happiness is really a subjective 
uh, a way to measure well-being and well-being is 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 the objective uh data but um i think it you know the real resistance to this will come from people who feel threatened by the implications uh the implications mm -hmm. around things like equality the implications around mm -hmm. things like in, environmental protection i mean those things are real and they will uh they, there will be a backlash when you try to change things and make policies that improve well-being if, if we look at the, the world's happiest countries today according to gallup at least or the world values survey they tend to be the scandinavian countries and the netherlands northern european countries with very strong social safety nets very short working hours, uh, very high degree of uh, equality, uh, not a big gap between rich and poor. Uh, Richard Easterland, who was the one who came up with the concept, who said, you know, past a certain point, GDP doesn't make people happier, you know, growth doesn't make people happier. What Richard Easterland in his most recent paper says is that social safety nets do make people happier. And that is the important thing. It's what you do with the GDP. And if you, yeah, if and you have a safety net, you do make people happy. And I want to add here, Anna, that, um, you know, from the work, I'm doing really work in the field here. And we really get two objections. Um, one from the one side saying that government's purpose, government's business is not happiness. And the response to that, well, is that in fact it is. Our Declaration of Independence clearly states that it is. And when you look at what is the purpose of government, it's it's not to to foster a healthy economy, it's to foster a healthy population. And how you define that is really important and the use of a subjective measure is absolutely key and is being seen more and more, more, um, more as key to that. So the second objection that one gets is, is that the, there, we, the field is not mature enough, that we're not ready to use a subjective measure. And the OEC just, just this year published um, guidelines for subjective well-being measures. And you can read that document, it's online, and you can come to the conclusion that in fact, the science isn't ready for government to be using a, a subjective indicator of well-being and that, um, and that we still need to develop that science. And yet governments are using it um, with the understanding that this is a developing field and that if we rely purely upon the scientists to um, to develop the perfect subjective indicator of well-being or if you want to call it happiness it doesn't really matter what you call it um, it, it would probably be too late because when we do talk about happiness um, as is clear to I'm sure everybody on this call is that we are talking equally about the environment as as, as society and, and the economy so and those are the two objections that I most often see. Um, there's a great talk that John Hall from the United Nations gave. He um, used to work for OECD um, that, that, that speaks to exactly that first point. What is the, what is the, what is the, what is the purpose of mm -hmm. government that, that um, you can get a recording of off of our, our base camp? So Anna, is it, is, did you get your question answered? Is there anything else? Yeah, thank yes, you very much. much. I'm, I'm, I'm listening from England. England. And then, uh, I'm, I'm not a very positive, positive person. Um, but in the UK, I suspect that the regional Cameron government were looking at the situation is that they couldn't record any positive news about the GDP. Um, so they decided that this would be a great alternative. If you look at Osborne's policies, they are not necessarily um, in the direction of making a large number of, of the people of Britain uh, experience but we have to make progress by making people aware, and I think that's a positive sign, and I thank you for this webinar. Well, thank you much. We'd, we'd love to hear if you have any other feedback about what's happening in, in Great Britain around GDP. Mm. I mean, G G G G sorry, around happiness, because um, we often mm -hmm. cite you, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear from you. Anna, did you see the big report that did come out? It, it didn't. Uh, it didn't seem to whitewash the problems or uh, the issues. It, it sort of said that things weren't all that good and people weren't all that happy. Um, um, no, no, I, I, I agree with that. that. I think, as, as I say, I'm normally, normally a very positive person. I, I, I think, think the fact, fact that it is been acknowledged by the government, government uh, is, is extremely, extremely important. important. I mean, it's actually being discussed. discussed. Uh, I, I think, think the challenge, challenge we have at the moment is that there are a number of decision makers and 
you know, individuals in the business industry or what have you, um, really can't face up to the fact that if an economy might grow in terms of quality, quality of life, quality of personal experience, as opposed to growing in terms of something, getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that under, underpinning everything is, is we come back to this whole issue of how can we finite beings keep growing materially on finite beings. Beautifully stated. Thank Absolutely. You. The uh, the econ Chilean economist Manfred McNave, who was part of our group in Bhutan, talks about this, saying, you know, that that when when we're referring to those things, probably the better term is development, and uh, that mm -hmm. development does not require growth. You know, uh, that Absolutely. development is 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 a different thing, and it measures success in these areas. It could require growth, and in in poor countries, it it often and usually does require growth because people really yeah, yeah. need to meet basic needs. But beyond a certain point, development doesn't require growth and growth may run counter to development. And this is the argument that's made by Stefano Bartolini, Italian mm -hmm. economist from the University of Siena, in his new book, uh, Manifesto for Happiness, which came out in Italy, it was a bestseller there. It is going to come out this year from the University of Pennsylvania Press in English, and I've had a chance to read the translation. And uh, Bartolini's view, very, very interesting as an economist, is that, um, in fact, high growth rates in the United States are not a symbol of economic dynamism, but a symbol of social decay and the loss of, of ways to meet needs that are, are not so expensive, not so costly. So Bartolini says, you know, we've, we've created a society where people are lonely, where they're disconnected, all of these ki kinds of things where the environment has gotten worse. And we sell that back to them in private products, you know, buy this car and you'll be loved. Uh, take this trip to uh, uh, someplace, you know, far away and ex experience a pristine environment. All of those things cost a lot of money in the private sector. They add to GDP. They make the numbers look great for GDP, but they are not necessarily a measure of success at all. Thank you, Anna. Really, really appreciated your your um your input there. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you. Well, thank you. And we're gonna go to Paul. So I'm gonna unmute you, Paul. All right, go ahead. Oh, hi, right. Right. Thanks, thanks, Laura, and, and thank, thank you, John. John. And hello, hello, John. Hi, uh, Paul. Good to talk to you again. <laughs> Paul was uh, part of the group in Bhutan with me, so. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Uh, uh, and, and very, very good, good uh, presentation, presentation, John. John. I'm, I'm still, still learning, learning many things, things. And, and that, that was, was very helpful. helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I, I put, put my, my hand, hand up to answer um, um, some of Lord, I mean Anna's questions there or concerns there, because, because I was also at the second of April meeting in, 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 in New York, York the UN, UN last year. year. And, and had, had a very, a very good, good conversation, conversation with Lord, Lord Gusso Donald, who, who represented the UK government at that, that meeting. meeting. And, and uh, in, a in a private, private conversation, conversation with him, with, him, with another, another colleague, colleague of mine, put, who, who put the question to Gusso Donald, is David Cameron, Cameron really behind this GNH agenda, agenda? Or is, is he just doing it to give lip service to to to, to, uh, uh, to what, what this GNH is all about. And, and the, response the response from Gasso Donald was, was that David, David Cameron, Cameron is an awful lot more committed to this agenda than, than he can publicly admit at, at this time. time. Because, because if, if the media, media and business, business concerns pick up on this enthusiasm, enthusiasm and, and misunderstanding to some extent, extent then, then it, will it will create all sorts of problems in the media and amongst business as to what is going on. on. So, so to, to avoid that situation, they're moving in a very cautious uh, manner with it. So um, I, I, hope I hope that gives you a, a cause for a little bit more optimism. And equally, there is a, an institute in the UK called the, I might pronounce it wrong actually, called the Lecton uh, Institute. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look up that, that name and, and, and uh, their, their website, website. And, and they're, they're doing, doing an awful lot of work on this well-being 
uh, approach, approach, how to, how to measure, measure it, and the right metrics are, and, and so on. And uh, uh, they, they have some, some good reports produced, produced and, and forthcoming, and, and they, they are very, very much engaged, engaged at feeding in their findings to a high level of government, government in the UK. UK. So, so I just, just wanted, wanted to mention, mention that, and, and then, then also ask John if you, you have dates, dates for these meetings that you mentioned at the end of your, towards the end of your presentation, which uh, I, I, I guess we're all based, based in the States. States. And, and the second question would be, be do you have, have um, any, any idea, idea about, about the, a release date or time scale for your film that you're producing, producing John? John? We'd be really, really interested, interested to know about, about that. that. Well, let me answer the second one final thing. thing. <laughs> let me answer the second <laughs> question first, because that's a simple one. Oh, no, right. I don't okay. have any idea, and the, the film is, uh, is, is still basically a, a dream, because it's going to take some funding and some other things, so no, no clue on that one at all. I don't know the exact dates. Uh, we've been kept a little, and I know I'm sure that's true for you too, Paul, we've been kept a little in the dark about what's happening now, and I think we need to wait uh, until the, these uh, new elections in Bhutan play out to say, and the new government takes takes uh, place for, for Bhutan. And then I assume that some of this these dates and things will be decided on rather rapidly. But I, I think that's what's going on right now is that, that, that not much is happening because Bhutan is in the middle of an election. And uh, unlike most countries, when Bhutan has an election, they actually close the government down. And they, the king appoints a kind of a caretaker government for the short period of the elections. The prime minister is not in power. Uh, and so we're waiting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And, and uh, uh, just, just on, on the, the election, election, it's, it's the, the 31st, 31st of May, May that they, they have, have uh, elections for um, four, four parties, parties representatives from four parties. parties. And, and then, then um, um, I learned... Learned that, that uh, uh, they will then have, have a, a, a date, date the 13th, 13th of July, July which, which will be a, a two-party two playoff, playoff election, election, if you like. like. So, so we're not going to know until, until the middle of July, of July what the results, results of the general, general election are. Ah, right. Okay, thank you for that information, uh, Paul. I did know the May 31st date, but not the July date, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Thank, thank you, you Laura, Laura and John. John. Oh, thank you, Paul. Wonderful. By the way, uh, Paul has been working on uh, the business connections with this, a sustainable business, and, and working with Bhutan around how to get this message out to business. And I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Paul, but uh, <laughs> but Paul has, has done some wonderful work in this, this area uh, with a number of other people. And I think you're planning some kind of conference in Bhutan around business if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes that's, that's, the, that's, that's the plan. plan. The 2nd of April, April meeting, uh, one, one of the, the most memorable parts for me was when Helen Clark, Clark in, the in the morning session, session between, between some, some of the high-level speakers, speakers looked, looked across, across the podium, podium to Ban Ki-moon Moon and, and said that she believed that during his second term in office, his legacy, his legacy to the to UN in the world would be, be to replace GDP with GNH. And, and I've, I've said, said that, that to so many people, people since that meeting. And, and uh, some, some people just laugh and say that will never happen. happen. But the, the truth, truth is, is, is that, that was the enthusiasm, enthusiasm at that, that meeting for that, that to happen. happen. Um, and, and in a conversation I had with the, the Prime Minister the following day, I suggested, I suggested that, that well, well, I congratulated him, him for bringing this incredible, incredible meeting together, together and, and to hear Helen Clark, Clark say that it was just utterly uh, full, full of, well, it well, filled, it filled me, filled me with enthusiasm, enthusiasm and, 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 uh, and uh, intention to, to, to help. help. But, but to replace GDP with GNH, would it be possible, possible to do that without the support? Of, of multinational, multinational corporations, corporations. And, and to, to, to bring, bring that to be, you really need to be working on what it makes sense to work with the coalition of the willing amongst businesses to usher these metrics in. in. And, and so, so um, that, that was the starting, starting point for, for 
looking to see how we could bring together a meeting in Bhutan with with a coalition of the willing multinational corporations. And, and, and that's, that's what we're in, in dialogue with, with the, the Prime Minister's, Minister's office to, to, to do. There's, There's an awful lot of enthusiasm to do that. that. And, and the outreach that we've done, done to multinational corporations indicates strong support, support to bring that meeting together. But, but as, as uh, we mentioned a moment ago, ago we have, have to wait, wait until uh, uh, the ju middle, middle of July before the next concrete steps are taken. And Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my understanding, uh, my memory is that Helen Clark is the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. Yes, yes exactly. exactly. And, and now, now the head of the, the, the UNDP. Okay, great. Beautiful. Thank you, Paul. It's wonderful. Really great addition. So we are, um, I'm going to go ahead and mute, Paul. We're, at, we're coming to the end here. And Oliver, I see that you have a question. Um, and unfortunately, I think we don't really have time for that. We have two minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close up the call in the next minute, and then Oliver will leave your question, and then people you know, have to leave for the hour um, can leave, and people who can stay can stay, if that's okay, Oliver. So thank you all so much for attending this. Um, these talks are, are offered through the Happiness Initiative, which you can reach at happycounts.org. Um, our next talk is on the 17th of June and it will be on happiness for mindfulness um, mindfulness and happiness for a happy life and then the next the subsequent talk will be the next week on June 25th so the first the next one is on June um, June 17th and the next is June 25th where Linda Wheatley from GNH USA who was um, who worked with Tom Barefoot to help the government of Ver Vermont use the genuine progress indicator plus which is plus part is the subjective indicator of well-being, where they're using our happiness index, gross national happiness index. We'll be talking about the work that she's been, do doing, been doing at the grassroots level. So these talks, um, we offer these for free, but they aren't free to us. And unfortunately, um, we are 100% um, kind of reliant upon donations. So any donation that you can give to keep these talks going uh, are much, much appreciated. You can go to happycounts.org and you'll see the donate button. We, we genuinely do need these donations to keep the talks going. Um, we'll have to make a decision within the next two months of whether or not we'll keep them going. And unfortunately, that decision will be much informed by, um, by, by money. Um, but we do have an option of, of using others, um, others uh, tools to keep these talks going. Paul, you actually gave us some connection of other people have connections of how we can keep these going without uh, rather high costs. We'd love to to get that, get those connections, get that collaboration. So again, thank you to everybody. We really appreciate your attending. The next talk will be on uh, June 17th. Um, you can go to happycounts.org to sign up for that. And now, um, Oliver, I'm gonna go ahead and un unmute you. So you can go ahead and ask your question and we'll just go over time a little bit. Go ahead, Oliver. Uh, what what governments um, within the United States are, are engaging in happiness initiatives? Obviously, there was um, a resolution passed by the Seattle City Council, but uh, how widespread is the movement within the United States? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that. This is Laura. I'll answer that. So we have about, about um, 40,000 people. Um, and this is a running average over the last three years have taken the gross national happiness index and we give out unique codes. So we've given out about 150 different unique codes to cities, campuses, and other groups across the United States. The cities that we're working with include more recently Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then we're working with, um, oh, and that's, I'm going to go ahead and, and mute you, Oliver, because that's, a, that's feedback there. So we're working with um, people at the county level in, in Albuquerque, um, New Mexico, and then we're also we also worked with uh, government officials in um, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and um, we're continuing work with Decora, Iowa, um, working through the library there. Um, we worked with Nevada City, California, where they were looking at this um, for a specific decision, an infrastructure decision, um, and. You can go to our website, go Happiness Initiatives in Action, and you'll, you'll see some of the others, other organizations. We've got a lot of activity at the campus level, and John really helps to lead that. So I'll turn that part of the question over to John. You want to talk about some of the campuses that are doing this? Yeah, we've had a number of, of schools that have done this uh, uh, and are involved in this in some, some way, uh, schools 
very small schools like Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire, which ran a whole program of students around the, the happiness initiative, uh, schools like the University of Michigan, schools like uh, Eastern Washington University, which had a very uh, prominent uh, happiness campaign and, and a number of others that are, are uh, interested in working on this. There are also at the state uh, levels, this great uh, new interest in genuine progress indicator and, and, and to some degree in the interest in, in G, uh, GPI, genuine progress indicator plus, which would also include uh, happiness data. And that's happening, uh, first it happened in Maryland, that's the first state to have a, a GPI, and then Vermont is uh, developing a GPI plus. Uh, and now Oregon is, a, I think, a, the, will be the next state to do that. And I'm meeting in the very near future with the first lady of Oregon. She and uh, the governor, uh, John Kitzhaber, the governor of Oregon, just went to Bhutan about three weeks ago for a, a week-long meeting to look at applying uh, happiness stuff in their state. And uh, they came back very, very enthusiastic about this. So I think the, the, the idea is spreading. Great. Right. So thank you all very much for attending this call. Once again, um, these webinars are recorded and we post the recordings up on Basecamp so you can have access to that. Um, if you would like to have more connection with John, please um, shoot me an email at laura at happycounts.org and I'll make sure to connect you with John and also get you on Basecamp if you're not already on that so you can have access to um, this recording of this, uh, of this talk and all of the others as well. If any of you would like to give a talk in the future, please let me know. Um, and um, thank you all again so very, very much and have a wonderful day. I'm going to start unmuting people so they can say goodbye now, which will create a lot of feedback, but you can all just say goodbye um, as I unmute you. <laughs> thank, you this is John. thank you to all of you for, for your patience and it was great to be on. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Have a wonderful day. Good night. Thank you.